Hey there, I'm Lee Ullman here with some big news from the National Young Farmers Coalition. We're partnering with Heritage Radio Network on a special season of The Farm Report. It's all about what's happening with the Farm Bill and how it impacts farmers and eaters. I am growing diversified vegetables on land that's been in our family for 150 years. And so with the pandemic, gentrification, property values going up, we had to sell the land and we lost it. Join us as we uncover the untold stories behind this massive piece of legislation that shapes how we grow our food, what we eat, and so much more. The problems we have had, those are things that come from earlier Farm Bill and USDA policy, right? Like Earl Butts, get big or get out. You know, it's my responsibility to know not only what I'm eating, but then like how, how that all came to be and realize like, wow, like this piece of legislation, all this money, like it's technically something that I support as a taxpayer. While Congress debates the next Farm Bill, this is not just an invitation to listen. It's a call to action. Be part of the conversation. Subscribe to the Farm Report on Heritage Radio Network wherever you listen to podcasts. Today's program is proudly brought to you by Whole Foods Market. Visit WholeFoodsMarket.com or download the Whole Foods Market app to learn more and find the store nearest to you. You're listening to Heritage Radio Network. We're a member-supported food radio network broadcasting over 35 weekly shows live from Bushwick, Brooklyn. Join our hosts as they lead you through the world of craft brewing, behind the scenes of the restaurant industry, inside the battle over school food, and beyond. Find us at heritageradionetwork.org. Hello, and welcome to A Hungry Society. I'm Korsha Wilson, and this is a show where we talk about food, food media, and so much more. Today's guest is Adrian Miller, a.k.a. the Soul Food Scholar. Adrian is a graduate of Stanford University and Georgetown University Law School, and he became a culinary historian and a barbecue judge after working in the White House under President Bill Clinton. He has lectured around the country on topics such as black chefs in the White House, chicken and waffles, hot sauce, kosher soul food, red drink, soda pop, and soul food. <laughs> in 2013, Adrian's book, Soul Food, The Surprising Story of an American Cuisine, was published and won the 2014 James Beard Foundation Book Award. His latest book, The President's Kitchen Cabinet, the story of the African Americans who have fed our first families from the Washingtons to the Obamas, was published last year and was nominated for a 2018 NAACP Image Award for Outstanding Literary Work of Nonfiction. Adrian, yes. welcome to the show. All right, good to be with you. Um, your background is like so extensive. I didn't even go into like all the cool political stuff that you've done. So is that a nice way of saying I can't hold a job? No, <laughs> that's a nice way of saying your resume is very long. Oh, okay, gotcha. All right, cool. Um, I'm I'm really happy to have you here. I feel like I listen to so many shows of uh, Nicole Taylor's podcast, oh, yeah. uh, Hot mm-hmm. Grease, which used to be on uh, Heritage Radio. Right. Uh, you are a, a frequent guest. Yeah, yeah. No, she's good people. So. Yeah, she is. Yeah. She's She was my first guest ever on oh, this nice. show. Oh, yeah. nice. Right. Started off with a bang. Yeah, shout out to Nicole. <laughs> but um, can you talk a little bit about your work for people who maybe aren't familiar? Sure. So... Um, what I try to do in my work is highlight stories that I think have been untold or not told the right way. So with soul food, there was so much criticism of the cuisine. I just really wanted to find out what sort of facts from fiction. And then as I was researching the book on soul food, I came across these African-Americans who had cooked for our presidents. And I only had a, f- a few stories that I had pulled together. So I just thought, well, if I can just get enough stories together to create a book, I'll do so. And through my research... I found identified 150 African Americans oh, wow. who have cooked for our presidents from uh, George Washington all the way to the current president, and um, I think it offers a unique window on the presidency that we've just never really heard before. Yeah, not together. I mean, people, the newspapers and magazines of their day certainly mm-hmm. talked about these cooks. Um, not all of them, but some of them. But no one's ever compiled kind of a collection, a collective biography. Right. Um, well, one, um, there's. There's a black chef in the in the White House now. Oh yeah, there's three. 
There's three? Yeah, they've been holdovers at least, at least from the uh, Clinton years. Oh, wow. Yeah, they're, so they're staff. They're kind of assistant chefs on staff. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, the, yeah, there's usually at least one African-American in the kitchen because there are a lot of military cooks mm-hmm. who get detailed to the White House. So um, Navy cooks often work there for short stints. Mm-hmm. Um, because typically there's the executive chef and then the pastry chef. The pastry chef may have an assistant. And then there are anywhere from three to five people in the White House kitchen. And mm-hmm. the White House kitchen is not very large. It's really actually not too much bigger than this studio. Really? It's 26 feet by 32, by 30 feet. That's yeah. tiny. And yeah. I imagine they're feeding well, a whole staff of people. Well, the, so there's, there's cooking for the staff and then there's cooking for the first family. When they do the big state dinners and other things, then they have to hire extra staff to help get the cooking done. And usually what they do is get, they create cooking tents outside of the White House. Oh, wow. To help assist with the food preparation. Did you spend time like going into the White House and, and um, like going behind the scenes to see how all this works? Uh, no, because I, I actually submitted a couple of requests to the Obama White House to mm-hmm. interview the African Americans on staff. And not only did I get a rejection email, but 20 minutes later, I got another one just in case I got it twisted the first time. <laughs> They're like, we just want you to be clear. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Do not show up here. <laughs> right. So I didn't get that. Um, so a lot of it was really talking to the White House alums. Mm-hmm. And um, even then, uh, I didn't get any African-Americans who had been in the White House kitchen. But I, I was able to talk to the first African-American who served on Air Force One. Oh, wow. And then um, the first, well, he wasn't the first, but one of the African-American executive chefs of the White House mess, which is not a political statement. That's just the name for a dining space. <laughs> the, in the mess West hall. West. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's a military term. Right. So right. Um, that's where the Navy cooks have their own kind of kitchen and they um, cook for, a, a, it's like a p- clubby private dining space for senior staff in the White House. Mm-hmm. So prior to, to this book, you wrote a, a great book about soul food. Um, and the surprising history of soul food. Um, do you think? Do you think there are a lot of misconceptions around? Oh yeah, soul I food? mean, I mean, just to be topical, what happened in NYU um, just recently, where yes, there was a Black History celebration, um, and it's the facts are not clear to me altogether, mm-hmm. but it seems like a couple of African American staffers in the kitchen brought the idea, but it was presented with no context. So somebody comes in the dining room, sees this, thinks about the negative stereotypes of, mm-hmm. of soul food. And, you know, really visibly upset and understandably. Yeah. So um, I think the narrative of soul food as the master's leftovers or unwanted food mm-hmm. is so dominant that it's clouded out any other really complex uh, view of soul food. So in my book, I wanted to, you know, show the complexity of soul food because it's, it's a mix of celebration food and everyday food. It's food that used to be royalty food. It's food from West Africa, from the Western Europe, the Americas. So I just think um, only one narrative has really been told about soul food. And it's correct to some extent, but it's not the whole story. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, just to backtrack a little bit. So that NYU story, uh, what basically is two staffers. They made, they made ribs and like collard greens and mashed potatoes. and Red Kool-Aid mm-hmm. and watermelon water. Yeah, watermelon water. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was presented without context. So, you know, as a student showed up and they were just like, um, what is uh, all this? <laughs> right. And so I'm sure, I'm sure, understandably, they might be thinking the white majority mm-hmm. is making fun mm-hmm. of black, uh, you know, African Americans through this uh, stereotypical food that right. caused a lot of pain over time because of the racist stereotypes mm-hmm. to which this food was associated, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, I, again, in my work, I'm trying to say, Yes, the food was used for those purposes, but that shouldn't be the end of the story. There is a positive story here that's rich, it's complex, it shows the ingenuity of our ancestors in, in turning what these different, you know, melding all together these different cuisines from different parts of the world to create something delicious. Right. Um, when you say that, I think of, um, that's all, often like a common refrain when we're talking about soul food or or southern food which we'll get to in a minute those two distinctions but um there is you know it's often like oh well these were the scraps that were left over and were turned into something beautiful but um thinking about it it's like if you constantly view it from that lens then you can't help but to see it as as somewhat like unwanted or or not as um well the not as like um revered as any other type of cuisine so there's two ways to look at that narrative right one is okay they transformed unwanted food into something palatable 
right? Um, but the other thing is to say, well, they took these foreign ingredients and tried to m- mimic something they were used to at home from their home country. They couldn't do it, so they had to put their own spin on it. And so you could you could have a negative view of it where it's just like, okay, they're just taking something undesirable and just making it passable. Or you can think of it as an empowering ne- ne- uh, narrative. It's something like these people created something um, you know, again, trying to recreate home under very difficult circumstances. And then it gave birth to this cuisine is, that's mimicked by other cultures. Mm-hmm. Um, Depends on how you, you know, yeah. look at it. Yeah. And some people call it soul food. Some people call it southern food. What, what, what do you make of all that? Well, I just think it depends on where you're from. So when I was in the South, you know, I didn't see the term soul food used as much. In fact, people were as quick to call it home cooking or country cooking. Um, it's when you get outside the South that these lines really start to sharpen and be less blurry. Uh, and so I think, I think personally, soul food is really the descriptor for the food that African Americans are eating outside the South, because I think it's a limited menu of Southern food. And the reason why that's the case is as African Americans were leaving the South during the Great Migration, the commodity food system was evolving, and so only certain foods fit that system at the time. So uh, collard greens, for instance, outside the South are the dominant green, but that's because it was just sturdier and not as, you know, so it could last the train ride to different parts of the country mm. as, a pair, as compared to like turnip greens or mustard greens. I mean, there's new newspaper articles in the 1920s and 30s announcing that mustard greens are now available <laughs> uh, in town. So that just tells you that, you know, and then dried peas, like black eyed peas were dried and easy um, to ship. Um, catfish is an easy, easily re- uh, farmed fish, so that's probably why it's the dominant fish around the country, even though when you get in the south, you know, other fish may be more popular. Mm-hmm. Like in Florida, it's going to be mullet. Um, along the east coast, porgies and crappie may be more popular. Or whiting. Right. Mm-hmm. But now we th- but, but I think for most people, they think soul food, they're probably going to think catfish first. Yes. Um, so I lived in Boston for nine years, and... There was a, a restaurant uh, called Coast Cafe. If you're in Boston, I rec- would rec- highly recommend going. Um, but it was one of the like few southern restaurants in Cambridge, but it always had this distinction of being called soul food instead of um, southern food, which a lot of, I feel like, the white chefs used. It, they, they wouldn't use the term soul food, but the right. black chef that owned ca- uh, Coast Cafe called his food soul food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that goes back to the 1960s. And so there was a purposeful split within kind of the the, the, south, uh, the the South in the sense that you had black power advocates trying to figure out how to unify a very disparate African-American uh, population around the country. And so cultural ties was one way to do that. And so Sulk became more identified with, you know, black power, um, black ideology, expressions of black cultural identity. And so from that point, Seoul became black, Southern became white. Because before that time, if you look, at least in terms of food, um, magazines would often talk about Southern cooking, but they'd have a black woman Mm. in the illustration. So the the, the two were linked. Um, So we live with that today. Because when I go around the country and talk about soul food, I ask people, hey, name somebody closely associated with soul food who's on TV and is a real promoter. And usually I hear crickets for several minutes because people are racking their brains. And then I say, well, name someone who's Southern. Then they go Paula Dean, her kids, Trisha Yearwood. There's a lot longer list of people that are readily available. Mm -hmm. And so one of the hottest discussions, and I'm sure you've had this on your show before, is, you know, who owns Southern food? Who's contributed to it? Is there fair attribution of uh, the contribution of, of uh, a fair attribution to African American cooks? Right. So that's one of you know this idea of culinary justice. That's one of the hottest discussions right now. I mean, the fact that people are naming Paula Dean and her kids, and then Trisha Yearwood, who has pivoted from country music star to Food Network star, uh, I think says a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, Some people they even name Paula Dean as a soul cook, as a soul food cook. Oh. Yeah. Wow. I'm like, I was like, all right. <laughs> You're like, sure. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, for the type of food that she cooks, I mean, you know, I, I could, some of the dishes I think you could argue are soulful. Mm-hmm. And again, when you get inside the South, it's just really hard to draw these lines. Yeah. Because a lot of white families had black cooks. Um, I found in my own research that it tended to be more about place than race or class because pretty much people of the so, same socioeconomic class 
are eating the same foods. Now, they may not be eating them together, but they're pretty much cooking and eating the same foods, whether black or white. So, like, what, what are those dishes that you would see, like, shared black or white? Well, for instance, like, um, white beans with some ham hock or some kind of other, other variety meat in them. Um, certainly greens. Um, certainly fried chicken. And now fried chicken may be prepared different ways. Like, if you go to a southern restaurant, you although this is changing now, um, you, you may only get certain cuts of meat, and it may not be bone-in. But now, because we're in a fried chicken craze, a lot more people are doing bone-in fried chicken all over the place. But back in the day, you, you just, like, you know, you wouldn't see chitlins in a southern restaurant, even though there are a lot of white people who eat chitlins. Mm. Um, and with the discovery of nose-to-tail cooking and celebrating the whole animal, we're starting to see things show up in white tablecloth restaurants that didn't used to be there before, like oxtails, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then in a white tablecloth restaurant, you could charge a ton of money for it, mm-hmm. whereas you couldn't in the soul food restaurant. And then there's a completely different mindset. Like if you told your friends that you were going to go get some pig's feet at Adrian's soul food joint, they'd be like, oh, that's so disgusting. Why are you doing that to yourself? But then you say, I'm going to go have trotters. Yeah, I was just about to say that, yeah. At Shea Adrian. And they're like, oh, Adrian is so amazing. He's honoring the whole animal. <laughs> taking us to places we've never been to right. with food before. You know? I, I worked at a restaurant and the, we it was an Italian restaurant and there was a special that was like pigs trotters and I was like trotters? What <laughs> are the animals that? And and the other black woman that was working in the same restaurant she was like it's pigs feet girl. <laughs> I was like oh okay it's pigs feet but we'll say trotters because this pizza is $18. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Did you see people eating those? Yeah people ordered them okay. and they were pickled too. It was like pickled pigs trotters it just Mm -hmm. sounded so like Mm -hmm. much more fancy than Mm -hmm. than pickle pigs feet see that's hilarious to me yeah um i think you touched on it a little bit before but the idea that a lot of this food is is it brings up like these kind of painful uh memories for a lot of black people and and carla hall has even talked about the fact that um there was kind of this like shame of being a Southern cook or, you know, identifying with Southern food. Um, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. So one of the saddest things that I've noticed is um, African-American chefs distancing themselves from soul food because of it, the negative connotations. Um, and I think part of that goes to how the South as a region has been persistently perceived in mainstream media. And then um, the two main critiques of soul food that have <laughs> been with us for decades one is that um, it's so unhealthy that it should have a warning label um, because if you eat this food on a regular basis, it'll kill you. Um, that so goes to thinking. And then the other is that this is slave food. And that's more um, of a negative ideology, that the idea that by celebrating soul food and eating it regularly, you're literally digesting white superiority. So I think that one-two punch has really limited soul food's appeal but then, then there's this whole other aspect of it, the, the idea of uh, people coming together for family reunions or a church dinner or other functions um, and how the food is delicious. Um, it's often associated with special occasions. And um, even when you peel back all of the glorious stuff, if you think about what nutritionists are telling us to eat these days, dark leafy greens, mm-hmm. sweet potatoes, hibiscus, okra, these things are the building blocks of soul food. So to me, it's a lot of it is how it's prepared, eating in moderation, portion control, all of those things. Because hmm. as much as this sounds like a great idea, fried chicken was not meant to be eaten every day. Right. Fried chicken <laughs> it was a special is, occasion. Right. Thing. Yeah. It's supposed to have it once in a while. But now it's, a, it's one of the ultimate convenience foods. So if you are in an agricultural context where you're working most of the day, you're burning off this stuff, um, but most of the stuff you're eating is seasonal vegetables, um, you know, not a lot of processed food. You're living off the land, so to speak. And then you move to an urban context where you're more sedentary, you're eating more processed food. You know, it's not going to do your body well right. in the long run. Right. You That's a adjust. big difference. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Even um, I, there's this author that writes about um, Puerto Rican food and when she moved to New York from Puerto Rico, she found that she was gaining a bunch of weight and she was making like mafungo and um, all sorts of Puerto Rican dishes. And then she dug into the history and was like, oh, these dishes were meant for people who are going to be doing a lot of physical labor, not for me, you know, working on a book 
<coughs> for eight hours. <laughs> right. So it's just that context needs to still be there with certain cuisines and dishes. Right. And one of the things I argue in my soul food book is that soul food is the migrant cuisine of the African Americans who left the South during the Great Migration. And if you think of immigrant food in this country, what we consider a person's food is usually the celebration food from their homeland. Right. Because what happens is you get to the new place, you're kind of you're poor, right? You try to recreate home. And if you can't get the same stuff you had back home, you know, you borrow from your neighbors, you look at what they're doing, you experiment. But then when you get to a point where you prosper, you remember the good times from back home. So you start eating that stuff more often. Mm -hmm. So things that used to be on the periphery of your diet are now on the core. And so that's where I think a lot of the health consequences kick in. And then I also think that soul food is getting a bad rap because I believe that a lot of people who blame soul food for the various health problems are eating a lot of junk food as well. Right, right. So they're going to the, they're getting burgers and fries and, you know, a lot of stuff that is not soul food. <laughs> right. In fact, I don't know a lot of people who eat soul food on the regular. Right. I don't. Yeah, I, I don't. It's a very special occasion thing. And usually I'm going out to get it. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with more with Adrian Miller. Today's program is brought to you by Whole Foods Market. From papayas and samosas to reishi mushrooms, if it's something that sounds delicious, chances are you'll find the freshest, best version of it at Whole Foods Market. They have more than 400 stores across the country, so if you consider pizza its own food group or just can't imagine when avocado toast wasn't a thing, Whole Foods Market has you covered. Visit WholeFoodsMarket.com to find a store near you. Whole Foods Market. Whatever makes you whole. All right, so we are back with Adrian Miller, a.k.a. the Soul Food Scholar. So we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about you personally. So Uh where did you grow up? Okay, this is going to lose me all street cred on the subject of soul food. Why? Because I grew up in Denver, Colorado. (laughs) I was going to ask you about that because I (laughs) thought you were from Colorado. And I love when you tweet about soul food restaurants in Colorado because people do not think of soul food in Colorado in the same, like, breath. No, they don't. And so um, the way I usually win people back is I tell them my parents are from the South. (laughs) So my mom's from Chattanooga, Tennessee, and my dad's from Helena, Arkansas. So this is the food that I grew up eating. Mm -hmm. But there are more people in, um, there are not a lot of black people in Colorado statewide, but in Denver, it's about 11%. So, you know, it's close to the national average. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we have a couple of soul food joints there, and I'm always on the the hunt. Um, We had a vegan place that was really good. Um... For a while, and vegan soul food is the hottest trend in soul food right now. Yeah, I believe it. And uh, <laughs> but it didn't last long. So yeah, I'm always I'm a big advocate. Yeah. For soul food. What is the dining scene as a whole like in Denver? Oh, it stepped up tremendously, especially in the last um, ten years. So Denver was long for a long time known as a steak and steak and potatoes kind of place, you know, steakhouse. Um, and then it's also the home of a lot of fast casual chains. In fact, in fact, a lot of fast casual chains come to Denver first to test the concept. Hmm. And I don't know what it is about Denver, but um, that happens a lot. But now we're starting to get more um, a variety of cuisines. And then to a suburb immediately to the east, which is Aurora, which is actually where I grew up. Mm-hmm. Uh, but most people don't know about it, so I just say Denver. Um, we have almost, you could have the world on a plate. Most of our immigrant cuisines that you're used to here in New York are arriving in uh in Aurora, and that, like, for example, there's a place that serves Uzbeki food oh, that's from awesome. Uzbekistan, right? That's awesome. Yeah, it's places like that. Um, so uh, I think it stepped up quite a bit. Did you go out to eat a lot when you were growing up? No, we didn't. So um, it was just every once in a while. And uh, my mom's a good cook. Um, and it wasn't like we were poor. We were a working-class family, but, you know, I, I, it was just kind of a splurge to go out to eat. Mm-hmm. Do you have any uh, memories of specific restaurants or dishes that you had growing up? I do. So uh, a couple of places that I remember in Denver, there was one called the Yum Yum Tree. (laughs) Okay. Yeah. And so this was like an early iteration of the food court (coughs) that would have all these different places. So you would come there and they would have Chinese, Mexican, but it was all under one roof. Oh, wow. So that- The original food hall? Right. So that was in the 70s. Mm -hmm. And then there's a place, you may have heard of it. I don't know if you're a fan of uh, South Park, but there's a place in Denver called Casa Bonita. (laughs) <laughs> and um, it's a, it's this like it's a Mexican place, and they have cliff divers and stuff. Yeah, it's cliff it's, cliff divers, like actual people. Yeah, yeah. So they have this waterfall and this pool, and so they would, 
you know, as a little kid, I just remember all these beautiful men going up there and diving into the, and then later you realize they were just scrawny teenagers that were hired <laughs> from the local school. <laughs> But um, oh, I'm confused. They were actual cliff divers. They would jump into yeah a pool of water. Yes. So you had your dining N- next area. to your dining table. Well, not right next to it because you don't want to splash water <laughs> in it. But you know, off to the side, there was this dining pool and a fake cliff, and they would climb up there and stand and then dive. What? Uh, what was the? I, I just as a theme or concept for a restaurant that's um, very fascinating to me. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe it's trying to recreate somebody's spring break or what something. What was the food like? Uh, it was horrible, actually. That's the <laughs> right. that's the joke about Casa Bonita. The only thing that's good is sopapillas. I don't know if you've ever... Fry bread? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, that's the only thing that's good. And it's still horrible. I went to a birthday party there a couple... It's still open? Yeah, because it's kitschy. Yeah. So it's a tourist attraction. And now because of South Park, it gets even more tourists. Because I was in a hotel a few years ago, and I, I was eavesdropping. And, you know, I just never really eavesdrop in... These two young ladies were asking the concierge, where should they go to eat? And they said, well, we really want to go to Caspanita. So I just, I bit my tongue. And then finally, I, after they finished with the concierge, I just said, excuse me, I'm sorry. But, you know, there's much better places to go than <laughs> Casa Bonita. And they said, well, we saw it on Soft Park. Yikes. So. Who's taking dining recommendations from an animated show? <laughs> Welcome to America. Right. 20, <laughs> the 2000s. Uh, do you travel a lot for your work? Um, yeah, so um, I get invited to speak about these subjects, and so I usually travel for those reasons. And uh, if I can, I try to stay in a place for a few days just to check out the dining scene, because there's only so much you can learn from online sources, especially mm-hmm. Yelp. I mean, I don't really pay attention to the comments at Yelp, Yeah. but it helps me. If some place is heavily commented upon, then I know, like, okay, maybe I should check that place out. Right. But um, as with anything, once you get in a town and you start talking to the locals, there's a ton of places that aren't online. Right. And that's unfortunate because um, today, I believe if you're not a business, if you're a business that does not have an active website or even a Facebook page, you're I think you're behind. halfway close. Yeah, yeah. And unfortunately, a lot of um, entrepreneurs of color are in, especially the mom and pops, are yes. in that space. Well, they're at the, a disadvantage. I mean, a lot of these websites are expensive. Having someone build it for you... Um, can be can be pricey. Uh, are there any favorite food or restaurant cities that you like love visiting? Like when you have to go, you're like, yes, I can't wait to go so I can eat. So um, I like the dining scene in the Bay Area of mm-hmm. San Francisco. Um, it's mainly the big cities. Um, Charleston, it's pretty impressive, and then New Orleans, Atlanta, and New York. So those are probably other my favorites. Mm-hmm. Um, now, if you get to specific types of food. <clears throat> I'm excited when I go to Austin and Kansas City because those are the two regional styles that I like the most. Uh, Barbecue-wise? Barbecue-wise, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, barbecue-wise. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What are your favorite spots in Austin and uh, Kansas City? So in Kansas City, I love this spot that's not well-known. It's called LC's. Okay. It's an African-American guy. He's been there for a while, and the locals really like him. Um, in Austin... My favorite is not actually in Austin. It's kind of close by. There are several cities that were within an hour's drive. Okay. And so uh, Smitty's in Lockhart, that's pretty imp- um, impressive. And also there's another place called Kreitz Market. Okay. That's really good. Kreitz Market. Yeah. Okay. I haven't been um, to Austin, but I've been to Kansas City. And then if you go to a place called Taylor, Texas, um, there's another place called uh, Davis Grocery and Barbecue. And that is a place run by an African-American preacher. Mm. And what you'll find in Texas and in other parts of the country is that there are a lot of church-connected barbecue restaurants. So a lot of people who feel called to preach the word of God also feel called to smoke meat. <laughs> right. And I'm trying to figure out what the connection is with that. <laughs> I guess it's a good combo. I mean, yeah. I don't know. Burnt offerings. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, okay, so I ask uh, every guest some set questions. Can you talk about one of the worst dining experiences you've ever had? And you can name the place, but you do not have to. I would love to name the place. I just can't remember the name of it. I may be <laughs> blocking it out on purpose. But um, so there's a place in, uh, it's called uh, Montrose, Colorado. And I was doing, I had a job where I had to do stuff around the state of Colorado. So it's on the western edge of Colorado. And um, on the menu was fried Oreos, deep fried Oreos. And I'd never had one before. I was like, oh, okay. Wouldn't expect that here, but let me try it. 
So I tasted it, and unfortunately, the cook um, made the Oreos in the same grease as the onion rings. Mm. So that's what it tasted like. Oh, that's gross. Yeah. Did you tell them? No. <laughs> Did you send them back? No. I just, you know, it was just so nasty. I mean, yeah, I just, <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why. I was just, it was appalling. <laughs> I love that that's a, a lot of people are like, you know, I went to this place and the service was terrible. And you're like, still, when when did this happen? This happened in 2003. <laughs> I love that you're still disturbed by yeah. the deep fried onion ring Oreos. That's, that's just no skills. Yeah. You have to true. know that you fry it in a separate grease. Yeah. Well, I, they're probably, I'm assuming they're not open anymore. I don't know. I haven't gone back. <laughs> All right, and my last question for you. Um, if you could have your last meal in a restaurant, where would it be and who's invited? Uh, so we'd definitely be at McDonald's with President Trump. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I would go to... <laughs> I would love this. I love this because people often ask me, what's my favorite um, restaurant, soul food restaurant? I love this place called Jackson or um, Bully Soul Food in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm-hmm. It's the kind of place where right off the main dining room, they have uh, a table where they're stripping fresh greens and mm-hmm. peeling sweet potatoes periodically. Oh, wow. So I uh, would d- definitely want my family there, um, especially my mother, because she's the one who taught me how to cook originally. Um, and then some um, some good friends. And then, man, it would be sweet if Michelle Owen and Barack Obama. Yeah, just came in, just yeah, walked just in. Yeah, just kind of, hey, what, you know, did some fist love. We mm-hmm. just sat down and ate. Now, can I invite other you can invite a- anybody, living or dead. Okay. And then we have Martin Luther King roll in. Um, I would be fascinated to talk to some of these cooks. Um, so Hercules, the enslaved cook for George Washington. Mm-hmm. James Hemings, one of Sally Hemings' older brothers. And then a woman named Zephyr Wright, who was the longtime cook for Lyndon Johnson. Oh, wow. I would love to have them at the table That's as well. a great name, Zephyr. Yeah. Zephyr. That's like a the great name. Yeah, isn't that great? <laughs> And then, uh, then at the very end, we'd have Edna Lewis stroll in. Yeah, you gotta have her come in. Yeah. Uh, what's on the What's on the table? Oh wow! So it'd be a mix of traditional soul food. So what I liked at um, Bullies is they have some smoked um, pork necks with uh, greens, black eyed peas, and then this amazing blackberry cobbler. Have you ever had blackberry cobbler? No. Oh, do you feel like something's missing in your life? <laughs> it's awesome. I actually I don't like pie. What? I, I, <laughs> David, the engineer just put his head up. I was like, what? Um, no, I actually don't like cooked fruit. So pie is kind of out of the question. You are killing me. I'm, okay. Uh, that's all right. It is not all right. <laughs> the way you said that, it's clearly not all right. And then we'd have to have, <laughs> yes. Then we'd also have to have some barbecue. So yes. I'd have to have some barbecue spare ribs, some link hot links. And those are my two main things. Uh, and then some red Kool Aid. Red Kool Aid. Yeah, I think red Kool Aid is the official soul food drink. That yeah. Well, I, I know I there's a generational that. split happening. You got a lot of youngins wanting purple and blue, mm-hmm. but as I write in my book, I do believe the children are our future. That we should teach them well and let them lead the way, but not on Kool Aid because they're right. messing it up. <laughs> we should make them drink the red mm-hmm. Kool Aid. They gotta know where it comes from. <laughs> is it just Kool Aid on the table? What else are you, is everybody drinking? Um, you know, there's probably some uh, lemonade. My family was not a big, we're not big sweet tea people. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think it would be lemonade and Kool-Aid, probably. Those are probably the two drinks. Any alcohol or just the? No, not really. We're not big drinkers. Mm. Nice. Collectively, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, I feel like I could talk to you for hours more about all this fascinating stuff, but. That's it. We're out of time. All right. Well, thank you again. Yeah. Thank you for coming. And thank you for listening to Hungry Society. I will catch you next week. Thanks for listening to Heritage Radio Network, food radio supported by you. For our freshest content and to hear about exclusive events, subscribe to our newsletter. Enter your email at the bottom of our website, heritageradionetwork.org. Connect with us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at heritage underscore radio. Heritage Radio Network is a nonprofit organization 
driving conversations to make the world a better, fairer, more delicious place. And we couldn't do it without support from listeners like you. Want to be a part of the food world's most innovative community? Rate the shows you like, tell your friends, and please join our community by becoming a member. Just click on the beating heart at the top right of our homepage. Thanks for listening. Ever wonder what kind of podcast Julia Child would have made? Probably would have been one where she introduced you to all of her latest discoveries and favorite people. And that's exactly the tradition we're following on Inside Julia's Kitchen, the podcast of the Julia Child Foundation for Gastronomy and the Culinary Arts. Join me, Todd Shulkin, your host, and the Foundation's Executive Director, as I bring you inside the Foundation's world to meet the bright lights of today's food universe, just as Julia used to do from her own famous kitchen. New episodes air on Heritage Radio Network, Wednesdays at noon Eastern. Listen in.